Hello, and welcome to another open source live code hangout. Today we're working on the Western Friend website. If you'd like to check out our source code, you can stop by github.com slash Western Friend. And the repository is westernfriend.org. It's the source code for the westernfriend.org website. Today's task, I'm gonna work on an optimization. A few weeks back, we noticed we were getting a lot of 404s on the new site, and it was because I basically neglected to migrate some redirects or uh, to create some redirects during the migration. But also, I think because we're getting a lot of bot activity some, that are just scanning our site. And what's happening if I search for, if I go to a non existent page. Some page that doesn't exist. Our site redirects to our search page and uh, takes the URL, splits it, and puts it as a search phrase. We did this for our convenience to help users discover the pages they may have been looking for. But what I'm realizing is it's mostly bots that are being redirected, some kind of 90,000 requests. This is not, our site doesn't have that many active users. It's causing undue load on the server. And because it's making a synchronous database request, it could be blocking other requests, causing page slowness, page load slowness and contributing to a, a reduced overall page uh, quality score. I'm kind of met, I can't remember the phrase here, mo monitoring. I've been setting up some things in Sentry and Cloudflare to monitor our page load performance. This page is being hit so often and the load time is relatively high. It's over one second. It's kind of causing all of our statistics to distort. Now I could try to optimize the search query, but I'm not really exactly sure how the wagtail CMS search internals work. And so what I could do to, I don't know what I could do to um, optimize it. Um, it's also, this search page is triggering several N plus one queries. So I'll have to come back to this and make this a lot better, figuring out how to prefetch related, for example. Or, yeah, because here we have an article with an author and a magazine issue, a related issue. And ostensibly, those are all relevant pieces of information to see on this display. But for each of those, we have to select a related entity from the table over a foreign key relationship. So it's leading to a, like a cascading n plus one query for every result. That's all uh, something I'll be working on in the, f in the future. But for now, I'm going to try to just reduce the load on our server a little bit. It's not uh, causing any severe issues, but it was just surprising the amount of time that our server is spending responding to bot requests on the slowest query of our site. This, this search page is the least optimized query. I have a few other N1 queries that we might be able to fix, uh, possibly during the session today. I've been identifying those. But the search um, is just, yeah, again, more opaque to me. It's coming from Wagtail search. And I should open a, um, perhaps a Stack Overflow question to figure out how to reduce the N1 query or prefetch related from the Wagtail search. But let's go ahead and continue this. So the idea is rather than doing the redirect, to kind of split the difference. So um, when we get a 404 re a page that just doesn't exist or maybe has um, moved without a redirect, we'll render the search field uh, form on the 404 page or a simple form that allows me to post to the search endpoint. Yeah, I think it's basically the same thing I'll have to figure out. 
and allow the user to opt in and click that. Now, I don't know if that's going to actually f resolve the issue. If bots are hammering the site, they might just, I don't know if they're clicking buttons or submitting forms arbitrarily. <clears throat> we enabled Cloudflare to see if it could reduce some of the load on the server. Again, this is not um, a major issue, but we can see here when I go now, almost you know two and a half seconds to render this. The search form is always going to be there on the page, on every page. But I would like to display it in a prominent location on the 404 page. So let's create a branch. And I'll remove my middleware, which actually caused another bug, an <laughs> unrelated bug. Intercepting 404s and redirecting to the search page. Turn out it <clears throat> caused one problem. Can't recall, recall, but I'd like to just remove the middleware. So 404, I forget where our 404 page is. Let's see what we have. This I don't even know if this idea will really work. But here we have a page not found. This page cannot be found here. Now, the question is, can I control the context of 404? I believe I can, and it might require a middleware. So I would like to in inject some page context of form. I'll take a look at this search form. It's basically this form here. And it, we're doing a, looks like a get request. So that's the first thing we'll look up. Uh, one thing I'll do just real quick is log in. We're going to use ChatGPT. I found it a little bit more efficient than um, searching even Stack Overflow. <clears throat> OK. So I'm running a custom 404 template, and I'd like to augment the template context for the 404 page to help users find content that they that may have moved. How can I add a template variable to the Django 404 page? Okay, so it looks like we're just going to create a custom view. That's handy. And then handler 404. That's interesting. So just uh, so we have the template, create a custom view, and you know this is the rendering the template and adding the uh, response code 404 so naturally the we do it and this is the interesting thing this must be something is a like a magic variable or something <laughs> that's kind of interesting Yes, handler 404 is a special variable used by Django to specify a custom view function that handles 404 errors. I'm glad it does that. <laughs> it's a bit obscure, but well documented and enough so that GPT knows it. <clears throat> so let's see. I'd like to define it perhaps in core, but not sure if core is treated like a uh, regular app. So I would check core settings. Core is the folder that Django generates automatically. And here's our response middleware. I'll, I'd like to get rid of that during this session as well. So we have core. Yeah, this is kind of interesting. Core is not defined here, so I would have to... Common might be a good one. Common, yeah. Views. Yeah, we're already kind of nothing here. Okay, never mind. <laughs> all right, let's... Okay, GPD, thanks for all of this. I'll just copy the code, and we'll you know make some adjustments to it. So essentially, the first thing I'd like to do is... Yeah, it costs custom variable there, and the exception is none. Change this to HTTP status, not found. And here we go. Cool. So then what I need to do is just... Essentially, this custom variable is the... Should I use get context or something similar? Yeah, it's not standard review. So what we'll do is just say context. Uh, 
Um, so let's see what it uh, that's kind of a vague one but uh, that's not quite it so yeah it's not i'm not prompting it correctly we're not actually after the query string we're, we're splitting the path that's yeah, better and split the path into keywords remove the first item list which is an empty string really search terms it's fine and then what we're gonna do is uh give it a clue how let me think here that's like actually probably it so it's a bit verbose and i'm not sure that this keyword pop is necessary but we'll find out i'll leave the comments in Some of them are a bit, a bit verbose. And I'll have to check my middleware because that's not quite gonna work. Well, okay, let's look into 404. Or for middleware, 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 core middleware, I think. Yeah, this is where I had some problems with PayPal here. Search query equals, strip out the slashes. Yeah, let me test this real quick. I think this strip, I should replace those with spaces because page width is not what we're looking for. Page width. Huh, okay, it works. So I think we just need that. Function here, okay. Yeah, and here we're not splitting it actually. We're just taking the path as a string and cleaning it. Now, can I, can I, uh, <laughs> see if I can format this a little bit better. I'd like to do something like that, but that won't work, will it? Well, if I do actually surround it by parentheses, then put one at the end here. You can, inspiration from my JavaScript friends. Yeah, <laughs> formatter doesn't like it, okay. That's cleaner, smaller, shorter. Less is more. Let me test this in Python. Okay, because I think uh, this strip might be unnecessary. Got a string. Hey, a strip is gonna take it out the front. Yeah, I see, I see, I see. Well, that strip will, at the end, will strip the white space off the front, so. And trailing slashes for good measure. And basically, path I should have done that and then what we'll do is try let's try path yeah so i'm not gonna mutate it yet yep so we get the spaces out get the slashes out and then we have a little bit of trailing leading and trailing which strip will take care of i think that's it so we don't need this strip here i understand why it was there, but since we're handling this strip later, less is more. Good, search query. Now we want the search form. I think we can get that from the, either in the template I just create a form that posts, makes a request. What kind of request is this form gonna make? A get request to the search. So yeah, we can uh, get request is fine because we're using the query string. I think I can just get that out of the core nav bar. Now here, oh, that's the log out. Let's see. Here's our search. Making a get request. So that name goes to the query string. So then our custom 404 is here in templates 404 common view.
It's just 404. They think the 404 just need to form. I don't know, something. Let's try it. Control D, run the server. Start the development database, run the server. Localhost 8000, and let's see if the 404 works. <clears throat> right, 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 right. We have the middleware still in place. So we'll have to come back to the settings, the middleware, and remove my middleware here. Then come back. Page not found, okay. Oh yeah, oh, I missed the third step. So now we have to edit our URLs. I have to read the instructions from GPT, GPT, chat, GPT, common URLs, pi. This is interesting. I can create this here, but I'm wondering if I just import it. Yeah, that's all good, all good. Just in my main URL patterns, the core URL patterns. We don't need a whole another one. URLs, pi. And we will call it 404 handler. And I'll point to common views custom 404. Page not found. Okay, okay, let's see. So I'm thinking I need to turn debug off, debug mode off. Yeah, here in the environment, one moment. <clears throat> All right, so I have an environment variable there uh, in the env file. That puts us in the debug mode in my local development environment. I've said debug is false. We'll refresh this thing. Uh, I do not have it set to true, or do I? Well, one thing I can do is just in my settings, strangely. That's the easiest way to do it, I guess. Page not found. Good. This could not be found. Got a search form there without the uh, button. Uh, so here, we're getting close. We're getting close. Value. And <laughs> copy and pasted. So of course we've got some copy and paste code. And instead we want to do the value. Hey, Blaze Labs, welcome to the channel. Yeah, it's a magazine website, basically. Online community site. However, I'm gonna be working on some other projects soon. A lot of it is Python and Django, but I've also got something cooking with uh, Flutter. If you're interested in learning the piano, making a piano app. How are you, how are you doing? Let's see, is it winter in your hemisphere? Are you in the Northern hemisphere? I don't wanna make any assumptions. I can't quite recall. So let's see now, do we have any search? Okay, so we got some value there. And the button, maybe it's just not visible. Yeah, there it is, okay. <laughs> there we are. And it probably doesn't need to be so wide. Because if I go full screen here, it's really wide. Okay, so let's see. Piano app for your iPad. Not a fan of Flutter, more Kotlin. Yeah, true, true. Kotlin's pretty popular. The problem is uh, Kotlin native, I guess you can do iOS or Android. Is that right? Have you done any Kotlin? Is it Kotlin nat native? I'm looking for a cross-platform development solution. That's why. <laughs> but I really like Dart. I like the Dart language. I think it takes a lot of the good parts from Python and a lot of the good parts from like TypeScript. Maybe Kotlin, it's, uh, I think it really balances. It's made some interesting decisions, the design decisions there. Okay, but yeah, I could check out Kotlin too. Uh, I've already started prototyping it in Flutter, but it's really just super early. Oh, I'm sorry, actually I misspoke. I was originally gonna make it in Flutter, but then I uh, made a, started a prototype with the Godot game engine. Uh, now this was done for a practical reason, that Godot comes with native support for MIDI input. I think for piano apps, 
I've tried a few. And uh, by the way, which piano app do you use? So I'm curious to know what your experience has been. But I think MIDI input is a good feature uh, from the user experience perfect perspective. And Godot has it built in, MIDI input at least, and that's all we need. So I don't, you know, I don't have to worry about using a library that might go out of maintenance. With Flutter, for example, there's a MIDI, a couple of MIDI libraries, but I don't really trust the Flutter ecosystem yet. In a similar way, I've had troubles with the JavaScript ecosystem, with things coming and going and Kotlin multi-platform. Okay, yeah, let me check that out. Smart One Piano App, good, because uh, I'm wanting to do some competitive analysis for our little open source app so that I might be able to uh, make a little bit of a business out of it, a little bit of side business um, while building an open source project. See if we can, and not doing something like um, the business source license, but genuine open source software by sort of having a way of generating a couple dollar, dollars here and there, um, having the app being freely available, but maybe per, uh, we can have content packs that like let you let you do more advanced music theory than the basics. Let's check this smart one out. This is all just kind of kicking around in my head, but the main thing is I, I'm learning the piano and I'm at the point where I need to start doing some drills. So re repeating things like arpeggios or walking bass with my left hand in particular is a weak. Smart tone, smart one, piano app. A smart one, <laughs> hacking it, okay, cool. I can't find it. One smart, oh yeah, yeah, this one. Okay, this is the top one. Let's see, do they have an official website or something? Okay, so you start playing in a minute. Ah, it's got a crash course, so it's gonna teach you some theory. Yeah, it teaches you sight reading. I find that a lot of them do that, and I like that it um, seems to follow the music, so you have some guidance. Okay, and it looks like you can do left hand, right hand, and then hands together. That's a really important thing. It's very common. I've also been observing how piano teachers teach. I'm taking a, uh, piano lessons once a week and um, I find that some of the apps such as Simply Piano it's good it's a really good app but it sort of feels like I'm on a treadmill sometimes where it wants me to play at a particular tempo and that doesn't always feel good it can be frustrating and I've seen this in other people who have played the Simply Piano app where it just sort of particularly when it starts to use a like eighth notes because there's like an exponential uh, curve of the speed that you have to do these pulses, the pulse, you know, uh, we're, we're talking about is basically binary s s curve. And so you might be playing the same tempo quarter notes comfortably, but if you play the same tempo eighth notes, that's not a linear <laughs> jump. And that's where it starts to get frustrating. But I've noticed in the, uh, to the point that piano teachers don't kind of force you to play at a, any particular tempo at least not starting out. Not in your first like three, five, maybe even 10 years, depending on your goals. Because they know we're not robots. You know, now we should practice with the metronome and try to internalize the clock and things like that. But yeah, it's just the Simply Piano uh, out of the gate sort of felt like I was being dragged along. Overall, it's a good app, but uh, this one looks cool. And, oh, Lang Lang. Yeah, nice. Whoops, where'd he go? Yeah, he's a good teacher. All right. I like it. It looks pretty cool. I'll check it out. Uh, I'll show you my favorite one. It's called Flow Key. This one's really good. Similar style. It shows you a video of it being played and highlights the notes to play. You can play hands together or hands apart. You can, you know, probably like this one, you can highlight certain sections, you know, to play a few bars at a time. I have to, you know, we have to do that to get those bars into our muscle memory. The nice thing about this compared to like Simply Piano, for example, is the songs you're learning are very pianistic. They're very natural because they're actually videos. So it's like a human playing it. And so you get this human feeling. It's not all sort of MIDI robotic. Uh, whereas Simply Piano and um, a couple other ones that use MIDI, it's a trade-off. They have a big repertoire, but it's not as inspiring to, as to hear somebody play a beautifully pianistic sound on a really nice piano. And this one waits for you if you want it to. You can play it at a particular tempo, but it'll wait. It'll pause here and wait for me to play those notes. And that's the way I see 
And that should be the default because that's the way I see piano teachers teaching. They just wait to hold the pencil and they say, no, this is F sharp. And they wait. There's no treadmill. Wait mode. That should be the default. <laughs> so this one's really good. The repertoire in this is excellent. But now here's what inspired my app is that these are focused more on repertoire and sight reading, for example, learning the notes, but not so heavily on technique building and particularly the technique we have to just kind of drill a little bit. Every one of our practice sessions should start out perhaps with a warm up that's a little bit of a drill like arpeggiations for example or chord inversions, just things we have to get into our muscle memory and not have to you know think so consciously about so that we can start playing more and more advanced pieces or more expressively our own pieces. So I think there's an actual gap in the market for these sort of drilling oriented apps to complement these rep the repertoire ones that do such a good job with even introductory lessons and things. And that's all our little game is going to be is just some kind of a drilling thing. Call, call them multi platform. So it's a long story, but uh, <laughs> that's another project I'll be working on here in the Godot engine, Godot game engine. Uh, cookie consent forms. Okay, so you got server caught on a server it's pretty common we're using that a bit at my day job but then we have multi true multi-platform not just mobile very cool and they'll probably have embedded cool it's got a ui yeah floki is really good i highly recommend it and we've tried several of these con Competitive apps. If you look at the top piano apps list, you know, from any arbitrary one, I also have a piano note subscription. They're really good. But uh, if you look, so we've tried Musician, we've tried Flowkey. Piano is really fun. It's like video things. And piano actually is good because it comes with four subscriptions in one. It comes with piano, guitar, uh, singing, and drums. So you subscribe to one and you get four instruments for a little bit more it's like uh, three netflixes <laughs> a little bit more than other subscriptions but it's not super bad compared with uh you know it's not going to replace lessons if you can do them but they're very good instructors very friendly it's got a community good grief let me just see the top list flow kill usually be we've tried scoove there's a site that ranks in music radar is probably one of the ones but anyway, Floki is usually up in the top 10, top tier apps. Good grief. And then Simply Pano is usually like the number one. Floki would probably usually be like the number two. Scoove is up there, but they're not as good. Yeah, and we did we did Simply Piano for like probably three years we had that one. So it's good, but treadmilly. Anyway, I don't want to keep going through all these cookie consent pop-ups, but super sold on this method of learning. I don't think this is superior for from a pedagogical perspective. I'd like to learn sight reading because that's going to open up the most doors. And this would feel treadmilly. You have to maybe we'll wait. I don't know if that's waiting. Online pianist is similar. Perfect piano. Simply piano is there. Scoove, piano academy, flow key. Wow, there's several of them. And there's one to teach you reading. For Floki, you don't need a... Yeah, I'm a bit of an entrepreneur. I'm trying to learn to... Uh, I've got several open source apps, and we're trying to build a business around one of them. Musician, this is the one from Finland. Playground Sessions, I tried that very briefly, just to get an idea of what's out there. For Floki, you don't need any sp yeah, special keyboard. Um, you know, I was going to mention this earlier. It will try to interpret your piano playing from the microphone. So... To that end, if you have a piano and a, you know your device has a microphone, it will you will be able to play. But it's better to have a MIDI device for any of these services. It's pretty complicated to for software to kind of figure out what chords and notes you're playing when you have many of them playing polyphonically. If you're just playing one at a time, it's pretty simple. But once you start playing multiple, because there's every note contains many other notes called partials or harmonics, it starts to get much more complicated. And so the accuracy of these um, software, any of the software is going to suffer. I just think this is a fundamental problem with uh, microphone oriented um, frequency analysis. 
And to add to that, you know, there's room noise, microphones may, uh, the, the, the piano may well, be in or out of tune, the microphone may be high or low quality, there's too many variables to have a good experience with microphones. So if you can get a, uh, like a, any piano with a MIDI cable or Bluetooth MIDI, you're good, you're going to be having a great experience because there's no ambiguity there. It knows exactly which MIDI note you played and each of these is essentially a MIDI note. Uh, I work at a day job and we do entrepreneurship in our spare time. We're trying to move into full-time entrepreneurship. I've got a co-founder on one project called Jerry Life. And we try to do open source work and we try to do work that's um, in the public interest, promoting like well-being. And so this is one of our tools. We built this here in Finland as a prototype with the city and it, it was very widely adopted. There was a government transition in Finland and we had to put the, it was kind of a prototype project on hold during the transition. And now that we're out of the transition, I'm taking the lessons learned from this JavaScript project, porting it over to Python and we're trying to reboot the business. So this is also built with Python and Django. I'm finding those for entrepreneurship. Django is a really good fit. It allows you to iterate quickly. It's very mature and stable, generally backwards compatible, batteries included. And we're keeping things very simple. So we're not building like a complicated single page app front end. I think that's a big mistake that a lot of projects make. And it really introduces a lot of complexity and disconnect. You have to have basically at least two people almost. It's hard to be a full stack developer with the JavaScript ecosystem being so complicated as well as getting to know the Python ecosystem deeply. I don't know how practical it is. So we're just going all in on Python with a little bit of JavaScript and no single page app framework. Keep things simple. So that's the other project here. So it'd be nice to be able to focus on these projects more full time in order to do that. Uh, having a day job is very beneficial and I value that. Now, I'd like to make these my day job while still being able to do these actually open source. Okay, so we've got the test coming in. So the value can actually just be now the context variable. Whoops. And I've already forgotten the context variable. What kind of keyboard do you have? How do we measure the impact of our work versus in open source? What are your aspirations? Yeah, very cool. Uh, by the way, though, what kind of keyboard do you have? I can take a quick look at that and see if you would uh, have a good experience with Floki with the one you already have. Generally, it should work with any keyboard, particularly if they support MIDI. Yeah, measuring the work is a bit hard, but that's exactly the purpose of this Jerry life, in fact. For the backstory, this was built in um, caregiving elder care community here in Finland and we realized that um, there was a lot of work going on and the basic needs of the residents were being met fairly well. I think Finland is famous, uh, world renowned for the health care and particularly the elder care. But we realized that there wasn't any kind of coordinated effort for enrichment activities like fulfilling activities, going to a concert or reminiscing or group activities. So we built this essentially platform to help make it visible. The people that were living in the home, that they were living fulfilling lives. Some people reportedly were sitting in their room in this instant institutional care and pretty inactive. Sometimes the families would be really concerned. Even there were newspaper articles written about it. And we didn't want that to happen, but we have to make it visible and measure the impact. How can we make it visible? Well, we, if we record just a little bit of data, we can make it visible. So that way the nurses in this home could check it out and be like, oh, okay, Ava and Kaisa are very inactive right now. We should probably prioritize them today. This Marti uh, is good to go. Pekka, Tina, all these, I know Elias, maybe they're, they're, Maybe Pekka and Tina have only had three in the last week, three activities. And these could be things like li uh, listening to music or doing uh, 
I guess art or going to concerts and this is outdoor activity. Sometimes you do self-guided activities and we also can tell what kinds of activities are going on and maybe what they prefer. We can sort of personalize the care, which is another important aspect. So this is sort of how we measure the impact. And um, we ran this in a citywide elder care system for, I think, around two and a half years. I can't remember the exact duration, but we were able to show that the trend increased, the activity trend increased from when we initially installed the system through the adoption phase. And then once it becomes visible, this is actionable information, not just for nurses, but a lot of times the um, activities are coordinated by um, volunteers. I'm looking for this real quick or family members, or we now have hobby instructors. So the new version of that shows the types of activities as well as like who's doing them. And it helps, this is at an individual level, but the homes, we can see that as well. It helps to know, oh, we might need more uh, staff. We're understaffed or the nurses are doing too many of these activities. It's pulling them away from their, the work that they're uniquely able to do, such as dispensing medication or things like that. So the volunteers are absolutely important. And there's particular other types of nurses, lahi hoita, uh, like, uh, uh, I forget the word for that, something nurse, uh, who aren't qu quite certified for so certain activities, but can do the well-being activity. So yeah, this is how, <laughs> it's a long story again, but how we're trying to measure the impact of the open source. Yeah, the MIDI is gonna be making the experience really good. So you can connect via a cable or Bluetooth, but a MIDI cable shouldn't cost very much. And it just depends on the device that you're connecting to, Android or iPad, and then uh, the type of keyboard. Sometimes they'll have this square end. That's like you find on the printers. I think it's USB B, like this one here. Yeah, this is the USB B. A lot of keyboards have this and this is going to plug into the ipad and you know i don't know about this particular cable it's three euros but aliexpress i don't know i wouldn't go that cheap in fact this is an interesting thing simply piano has such good customer service they actually paid for our usb cable and they sent us one or they paid for the they reimbursed me for it so uh I, I do like simply piano i just sort of we did kind of fell out of the service and I had to choose only one app. I can't have all these apps subscriptions. So we kind of went with Floki in the long run. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> the piano shouldn't cost. The one piano needs MIDI. So yeah, and our aspirations are to be a self-standing business. Uh, we just want to be a small business and have a product that we can sell and develop openly that other people can use and benefit from but we would like to sustain the business you know and pay salaries uh, for ourselves and if, um, maybe some other people offer benefits like a, a small business but not like a silicon valley business where you kind of want to get really big and expand and expand and then have an exit strategy and get bought out we're not in that mindset so let's see our value should be coming in to the template from the view okay so here i just need to rejoin the context i think render does render what is argument says render take uh request content uh, status context okay equals context render status none very cool okay now i think we're good to go and the search query is what i'll pop into the search form right here boom now let's try getting a page not found so this should be page not found in our search there it is okay i think this is going to be the good solution yeah so another page that we may have moved or may never have existed uh now we want to try that or may have existed in a parallel universe we get it it works so yeah the search term and then i can say oh yeah well i'll still just search for that so now they opt into searching. So I'm gonna have GPT kind of give me some writing assistance. 
ownership is structured right now we're a, an llc so limited liability company more or less in um in finland it's not exactly the same but it's very similar so we have it's myself and my co-founder and we don't have any other ownership structure originally we were we incorporated a, a cooperative and we just decided that um in order to attract other potential investors like uh, not not venture capital but just people who want to support the company or be part of it um and have shares in that i guess we should probably incorporate or get support from the government i think we also for some grants have to be a limited liability company for some reason they don't support cooperatives so that's the basic structure it's just a regular business essentially it's the most common form of business to my understanding all right so and uh, i probably don't need this to be header two i'm not sure why i did that that was kind of strange but here we go we apologize but it seems like this page doesn't exist don't worry we're here to assist you in finding what you're looking for you can use the search form below to help locate the content you need all right that's sort of friendly yeah yeah so refresh that so i think this is overall an, uh, a usable approach it's going to reduce the load on our server and let people opt in to searching now can i do uh, let's see make it a little more narrow what's the name let me double check this i can't even remember grid system there's a newer version what are we at 5.3 that's right, I just updated that yesterday. I wish just the dang Google results would link to the latest. <laughs> but they have to have 5.3 in the URL. And that causes the Google results to always be pointing to the wrong version. Full stack or just front end? Full stack, I would call myself. I do uh, dabble in JavaScript. I built a full stack app with JavaScript. And welcome to the channel, Crazy. Nice to see you. Uh, however, and on this project, I'm full stack, so back to front. Uh, however, I try not to get too deep into the infrastructure. So we're using a platform as a service, so I don't have to do like Kubernetes or AWS type stuff. I don't want to waste uh, time i don't want to spend too much time there so i don't get that deep in the stack and i have opted out of using a single page app framework because i don't believe it's a good fit for this project it would introduce too much complexity so full stack by keeping things simple it's a bit of a philosophical approach but it's in line with this recent trend towards well you know back to rendering things on the server as well as using more lightweight javascript for reactivity on the front end rendering partial content on the front end uh, such as using htmx uh, which is very becoming very co common so using you know html powers that have existed for a long time but haven't been uh, as well uh, you know leveraged we kind of took a detour through this single page app hypothesis and i believe that it isn't appropriate for most uh, apps I mean, it's sort of like it was a big tail chasing exercise in a way <laughs> and kind of constantly reinventing based on the mistakes that each uh, generation so to speak of uh, spa technology introduced and those generations come quick come and go quick about every six months to a year you know react is including in its own generational cycle <laughs> but i'm not using htmx here so that's a long way of saying i'm full stack but uh, keeping it simple like I use Bootstrap because it's actually really good. It's still keeping up and making changes. So yeah, no JavaScript build system, no build tool needed. So I believe this works. Now I can remove my middleware. Crazing, do you build any projects? What are you, uh, what are you working on or what are you interested in learning about? Right now I'm working on a project for this community website in the United States mostly, United States and Mexico, maybe in Canada as well called western friend uh, it's, so it's a live website and basically has a lot of features primarily it's a magazine and we have a magazine issue the most three recent issues are subs um, pretty much subscriber only except some articles that are featured the rest of them if you're not a subscriber it'll ask you to subscribe and you can read the full articles but once the issues um 
are about six months old, they go into our archive and everybody can access those. And uh, this is just to generate a little revenue. It's a nonprofit organization, so it's not like super commercial or anything. And you can just read everything here. And the cool thing, this archive of magazine issues is deep. It goes back to 1929, I think. 1929, boom. And all these are online and they're hosted by the Internet Archive. And that means it's also uh, the full text search capabilities. Like I can highlight the text and search is crazy. The Internet Archive is cool. Here's a bug. I don't know how to fix this a UI bug. But uh, anyway, we also have like a bookstore. So long short, it's a community website, but uh, it has a lot of features that maybe you would find in other websites. So e-commerce, it's got donations, subscriptions. Um, we calculate shipping. Uh, we have a library of multimedia items. We have podcasts, an events calendar, contact form. Yeah, again, subscriptions and donations. So it's not just like a simple blog website. It's a pretty, actually, it took us five years to build this. And we launched it uh, uh, a month ago, I think. Okay, what kind of site are you building? Yeah, the front end's a big, uh, big challenge already. The back end, and if you try to juggle front end and back end, yeah, I can see how you'd, uh, it would be very challenging. Uh, what are you considering though uh, building and are you thinking about Python or what have you, have you already started? Uh, is it open source? Can we take a look at the code? I can offer some perspective here. So let's go ahead and remove the old uh, middleware. That was again a core middleware. I think I can remove this whole file now. HTTP response middleware, very good. So we don't need to do that anymore. But if you have the choice and you're still in the early stages of the project, I really recommend using Django if you can. I could make some uh, solid uh, arguments as to why that should be the case. Although I see that you're, you're using a single page application Front end, so you might be tempted to use something uh, more lean, I would say, uh, such as like Fast API, which we use in my day job. But Django actually will provide you some surprising features that you don't really know you need until you need them, and they're there just waiting for you. So we can commit these, and I'll I can uh, actually revert that. We don't need debug now. Now we're just now I just reverted that. Oh, I see. So you got to save it, of course. Yeah, I can do a code review, Blaze. Glad to. I like checking out open source projects. You should be able to paste it in the chat. I think that I, I've got the settings to allow URLs there. Okay, so now we're just, we'll remove the middleware. So that's good. And we replaced it. Pre-commit hooks that are helping me write cleaner code. All right, copying that link, we'll paste it in a tab that we're. Oh. Blaze Labs, good. So HTMX don't need it right now. We're thinking about adding it to projects I'm working on. ChatGPT. Okay, Blaze Labs. Let's see what we got. Twitch agents, Convo XML, Python, SQL to Graph. SQL to Mermaid. It's a site that links builders to users, sort of like Upwork, but hard niched into the construction industry. Okay, cool. That's a big project, which I'm starting on January 1st. Nice. Yes. Yeah, you could do that. That's a CRUD application. So you're going to be interacting with the database. You'll be creating um, items in the table. You'll be reading from the database, updating and deleting items. CRUD app, right? SQL to Mermaid, probably the best one. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. The other thing is you'll probably have a lot of relationships in your data, uh, such as project could be related to organization or user could be relating to projects or builders and users, builders to users. So even in a description, you've got relationship. So please, at the very least, use a database. Don't go uh, with MongoDB or some kind of... Um, schemaless as they call them database uh, you'll find that you're going to be reinventing relational logic that's what i found at least with our project that we originally prototyped jerry life using mongodb we have libraries that basically reinvent things that would have been done off ready for us had we've used jank but so we have relational database and uh 
you can do full stack Django for the app. You probably don't need a single page app framework. And for the dynamic parts, if they do emerge, you can get by with Ajax requests and HTMX to have that really full first class uh, user experience without a full page refreshes for the dynamic parts. But start with just a full stack Django. Uh, yeah, what are your language preferences? Okay, good, yeah. Because uh, we're using MongoDB at my day job and basically we're also there, we're just struggling with um, some of the fallacies that MongoDB has introduced to our team. Like we believed, for example, we don't need data migrations because we can just the, um, put any shape of data into the collection and just get it out. And then what we ended up doing is just well, since we're not migrating the shape of the old data, we have a bunch of logic in our views, essentially, that has to handle permutations of data structures from previous, uh, essentially, evolutionary stages in our data model. Or we need a migration, but then we don't have a, a framework or any guidance on how to migrate the data, or even some of the gotchas that have come up during that discussion. It's not like it's, we're having to operate at a lower level and the guys I work with are really skilled and talented and knowledgeable, but um, even then, it, those are very complicated things to sort out. And if you have a framework that just has it sorted and encourages best practices out of the box, save yourself time and focus on your domain, which is the, what makes your app unique. Don't build migration framework. Django's got it built in or Ruby on Rails, something like that, build something Laravel. I've looked in the JavaScript ecosystem and not found one. There's a couple of attempts emerging, but I don't trust them. Uh, they have usually only one core developer, so that's a situation where you could even have a fly-by-night, or they are, even the ones that were built by companies, like uh, we originally did Meteor, and then that company that was building Meteor kind of bailed and sold it to a venture capital firm, and also they bet on some questionable, they made some questionable design decisions here. Yeah, it's, that's cool. And, and JavaScript is popular. The closest I found though in the JavaScript, uh, uh, ecosystem is, uh, there isn't really one that you could compare to Ruby on Rails, Laravel, Django. It's really surprising that, that and I think this is a symptom of the JavaScript community and mentality where like, I don't know how to describe it, but just things just don't aren't built for longevity. I think there's a lot of hubris and a lot of ego also involved with evolution and people wanting to be on the stage and presenting their ideas, the most revolutionary and newest thing, and please adopt this thing that I've invented. Uh, they want to be Dan Abramov's type type people. I don't see that as much in the Django community. Uh, maybe you know Ruby on Rails has uh, David Hanemeyer Hansen or whatever his name is. But JavaScript. I've looked in the JavaScript web for frameworks and most of these frameworks aren't really like frameworks in this sense of the word and now the JavaScript community has invented this thing called a meta framework which is making it even more confusing it's like they don't realize really even understand the what a framework is in the terms of rich web framework uh, most of these are just like front-end libraries uh, or, or conventional packages that let's see but here yeah, I also see these Google results but there's one yeah that's right I, I don't hate it I, I'd like you know I would mind writing you know JavaScript uh, I'm not super excited about TypeScript but I don't like the churn I don't like the dysfunction and I don't trust it to bet our products and projects on and I don't have the resources or energy or capacity to keep up with things and having your dependencies rot out from under you it's a really weird feeling like having to really get down in the <laughs> the weeds on framework level stuff like your test framework stops working one day or your um, ui component what's the uh, library um, is no longer compatible with your um, storybooks and, and components and, and you're just having to like fight the your tooling is like what is going on i need to just focus my energy on building and the product and while django for example is not perfect my energy has been going much more into just building and focusing on on making the thing that's unique so i've stayed away from that Next.js is not the one I was thinking of, but it's very popular. But there's this one oh, I can't recall. I'm not gonna be able to find it, but believe me, I. Uh, yeah, see, that's the, the confusing part. Is Bun is not even a framework. It's not a framework. Is a set of tools and conventions that help you 
complete tasks based on collective experience of other people in the same domain. And so a UI component library or like Bun is, is pretty phenomenal in what it's trying to achieve. And hopefully it maybe will help contribute to some standardization and, and uh, stability in the JavaScript ecosystem. I would like to see that, you know, cause it's got to build, it's a build tool and a language runtime and uh, linter. I think it's combining a lot of things into one, but all of those are just tools. Even the language runtime, that's not a framework. A framework is like thing, having something that's going to help you write views, like render data to the client, interact with databases, handle middleware requests, responses, validation, uh, authorization, authentication. Uh, that's a framework. It's like high level stuff. That's like batteries that you need in your app, but uh, that are very complicated to write. Like authentication is a really complicated thing. And there's a lot of things, mistakes that can be made. So how do you, you know, hash passwords, those like types of things. That's what a framework like Django is going to provide or Ruby on Rails. Uh, and I'll find the one for JavaScript. I'm, I'm not uh, in any way, I'm not, I don't hate JavaScript, the language, it's the ecosystem. And I wish that, I really do wish that uh, more longevity could emerge there. I think a lot of people are wasting so much time and not even realizing it um, because of the inadequacy of the, of the ecosystem. So here's what I mean, like by a framework. So you got data models, you can, you can design your data in the language of choice. So JavaScript, you could write a JavaScript class, uh, or here's a Python, you're writing classes that these are actually tables in a, in a SQL database, a relational database. You have views and you have a conventional way of writing views. You have ways of getting data in and out of a database, CRUD operations. Um, you, you have this admin interface, which is good for when you're starting out and prototyping. Uh, you have URL, you know, like design and handling. So you have, a, in fact, this was funny that the Meteor framework didn't come with a router, like a way of routing URLs. You had to turn to a third party uh, ecosystem and there was competing routers in the Meteor JS ecosystem. It's like, I think J Ra React router is like not a core thing. It's like a framework includes a router. You don't have to choose that. It's just part of it. Here you go. Here's your router and use it. This is server side routing, not client side. But here's a way of you write views. And you have this conventional signature. A view takes a request and potentially some arguments passed in from URL parameters and does something. It's just a function that does something, typically function based views, and returns a response that probably renders that. Uh, data to the to a template or it can return JSON response if you have a front end framework. But don't overlook a template library and JSX is a, a bit of a mess as well with the giving you so much freedom of everything being in JavaScript. Uh, JSX code starts to turn into a very confusing like really fast. <laughs> It's just because you get this tangle of uh, imperative logic and template logic and potentially um, CSS and JS, or it's like really like er, uh, early 2000s PHP where everything was just sort of bashed together. This gives you a little bit of uh, imperative logic like loops. Uh, and you know, interpolating data into the template, but it's primarily just HTML. And I know JSX sort of emulates HTML as well, but it's not. And critically, some of the semantics of HTML aren't like are, are changed. So you're actually you're learning a, a meta language. Currently working on sub projects. Okay, five locations from five input boxes. Rank them in order closest to each location. Yeah, this is interesting. Google Maps APIs, but yeah, errors with the node things. Okay, cool. So the locations, what kind of location data is it? I'm on a big tirade about uh, frameworks, but seriously, this is very important to consider, especially if you're wanting your project to last more than one, two, three years. And these projects do, they last very easily. Uh, I'll try to remember that JavaScript framework. I don't know that it'll last. I don't trust much in the JavaScript ecosystem. But anyway, back to your thing, Sales.js, we did take a look at that. It's been around for a while, but it's not really so rich. Maybe Hacker.io has this. Frameworks used in 2023. Starts with a C, I think. C. So React's not a framework. Jeez. 
Vue is not a framework. Node is not really a framework. It's a language runtime. Ember is not so much a framework. Meteor didn't turn out to be a framework. They don't have a router. They don't have an ORM or ways of defining schemas for the database. They had user authentication and authorization. No, they didn't have authorization yet. I don't know, Mithril might be. Polymer is not a framework. These are libraries that for user interfaces, backbone is kind of a conventional, but yet yeah, not here in a bunch of garbage website. So front end framework, I can get the idea there. So are you taking just basically a formatted address that's comma delimited locations or are you splitting up the address components? I have this exact problem I've been working on at work, literally. my uh, During my day job, we've been fighting the geocoder. So I can offer some advice there, language agnostic, about geocoding and what might help with your project. <laughs> We're using Python, but we're interacting with the Google uh, Geocoder APIs. Um, so it doesn't really matter if you do that with a JavaScript or whatever. Here, comparison. Okay, web framework. These are all front-end frameworks. It's not here either. So this is just weird. Mern. It's like there's so much churn remix. Granted, I mean, there are some exciting things coming up in JavaScript, so I can see the appeal. But hopping from stone to stone is not a way to manage a sustainable project. It starts with a C. Google autocomplete. OK, good. From com comma to divide it up. OK, cool. And then you get coordinates, coordinates back from that, right? Now here's a good thing. So how do you measure the distance of the coordinates? We use a GeoPy to get the distance. The here's what we use. There may be something uh, for JavaScript. So you don't have to invent your own Habersign function. Turf was the yeah, about the closest. I've, I've got a JavaScript project that was doing some geospatial stuff. So this would be a good one because these geographic stuff can actually be surprisingly complicated as you probably have experienced. I almost have to log into my work and we have this document that describes that. So much tap is stash is a template language. EJS is a template language. These are spells is sort of, so there's so much confusion about what it is, a full stack framework even. Granted, these are just trash sites, SEO content stuff. Hmm. Google has Google Maps distance matrix API, which can just straight in. Okay, cool. Okay, so how come you're struggling on that? Is it, uh, you're not getting results back like you expect or are the results, the quality of the results, not good? Because that's our main fight right now, where I work, is that the quality is not good uniformly. Some places, like the United States, I would suppose, are much higher quality. But we have uh, addresses around the world, and in particular, uh, some markets, you know, just have poor or non-existent coverage in a way. So, like. Yeah, it's a bit of a challenge. And uh, you don't want to invent your own geocoding service. That's really complicated. Look at feathers, huh? I can log into my company wiki. Oh, yeah, okay, gotcha. So, yeah, you want to be careful about that, but uh, you should be safe to make those requests to Google. So, now you're trying to convert it to Node, but it won't find your server, huh? Where is your server deployed? Is it behind a firewall, or what? I don't understand the kind of architecture there. Can you run this service locally, though? I mean, Blaze, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes, code review. Excuse me. No, I'm just, this is a really interesting conversation. You said the sequel had to Mermaid, right? <laughs> okay, so let's see. So first thing I noticed, there's no license. 
So that's one thing, add a license. So what you can do is on up here, there's this uh, button that says like settings or insights. It's right here, community standards. There we go. Yes, so do these, as many of you as you can. There we go, first code review. So that's a project level review. I work with a lot of open source projects, so I know the importance of these documents. Code of conduct, okay. It depends on how popular you expect it to be. But the contributing guide, that's really useful if you would hope that people will get any uh, like interest in your project and wanna write a pull request, give them some helpful tips on how to run the thing locally, for example. And you can look up some uh, templates, contributing guide template, or what here, I'll actually give you one from ChatGPT. Contributing guide template, what do you include in that? It's you know not always that easy. But yeah, like these are all pretty important things. Whoa, it's even giving me the whole dang thing. Uh, let people know how to help you out and you will f be surprised, people will help you out. So I can uh, I can open a pull request real quick. Where did it go? Where did it go? I hope that JavaScript fr framework just jumps out at me. So we're missing those, but you got a lot of, you got the description to read me, that's good. So choose a license though. It's not open source until it's got an open source license. It's surprising. Even though you put the source out there, it seems like it's open, publicly available, but open source means also that people can adapt it, modify it, and put, you know, potentially reuse it for other purposes. And you probably don't need a security policy or issue templates or pull request templates until you start getting contributors. So let's start there. So what I'll do is just open a PR contributing dot md and you can just take this or leave it I don't I won't feel offended this is just to give you something to work with and that way because I, I can't paste it into twitch chat but surprisingly Instructions like this can be really useful to new contributors. It can be confusing to even how to get your project running. Ah, at the bottom there's MIT license. Okay, so here I'll just propose these. You can check them out. SQLite to Mermaid. I see that now. Okay, so that's not obvious, but that's good. You got it in your readme that counts. Uh, so also GitHub can't uh, detect that, but if you put that, um, in your license file and this um, button here the choose a license will actually do that for you whoops community standards here this one right here MIT blaze labs to here you go Same thing, couple pull requests there to get you off and running so that you don't have to do too much of this groundwork. Yeah, cool, my pleasure. And I like this Mermaid.js, this is a cool library. I like, there's a lot of cool stuff in the JavaScript ecosystem, like library level stuff, but not for a whole product, but just to add, do like a widget or a, uh, some kind of feature in your user interface, but I don't trust to turn my whole project over to JavaScript or even just, or even the front end. Yeah, yeah, I, I Tread cautiously. Okay, so that's good. So community insights from a perspective. So let's come to the code level here. So I see you're using poetry, Pi project. Okay, so your Pi project could use some hygiene a little bit here. What do you like? What do you think about PyWrite? Is it pretty good? Oh, you're using Rough. Very cool. I like. We've been using that at work. We just changed this over Rough. Pretty nice. It's kind of like Bun. It's got a little more. Uh, <laughs> Uh, batteries included and it unifies a few tools which is nice and is built with rust so it's fast pyrite though I haven't used so yeah this is cool so we clean this up a little bit just put in that metadata there and yeah uh, consider supporting Python 312 so suppose that you're using rough so the uh, code's gonna have good lint. I won't have to pay much attention there. It's got good doc strings. Nice. Uh, everything is documented. Very good. That's not common. <laughs> Surprisingly, get it, things are a mess. Okay, and then you got things are pretty well named. Okay, this is. Uh, I don't know. Is this SQL injection? Vulnerable. The F string. I'm always just cautious when I see. 
SQL with uh, interpolated values. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience there, but make sure that this is safe. Cursor uh, is coming from, ChatGPT knows, knows it is Python. So the Git tables I'm not so concerned about because that's just iterating. And who's going to be invoking this phone? Uh, also? You've provided a Python class named SQLite to Mermaid.js. appears to interact with the SQLite database and used for generating table details, including foreign key information. Here's a concise, straightforward explanation. All right, cool. Pragma fetch all is the... You probably already checked this. Okay, now, the get table details method in your code is potentially susceptible to SQL injection because it directly interpolates the table name variable into SQL statements without proper sanitization. This can allow malicious users to manipulate a table name parameter and execute arbitrary as SQL. It's meant to make DB relationships easy to visualize. There should be a GIF in the README. That would be good. Yeah, and your README always include like a screenshot or something like that. Very good idea. But I would even for some internal functions that you may think are safe, uh, do this. <laughs> So watch out for SQL injection. If you just uh, let raw SQL string be interpolated at like F string into a into a SQL thing, you're setting yourself up to, for data loss. Or I don't know where this table name comes from. So it could be just an internal thing. But even for internal uh, functions, just don't go there. A framework also helps you avoid that. So I think you're using, what was it? Yeah, anyway, not a big deal. I'm not being, that's me, not being too critical. I'm just double checking. You're using Flask is what it was, right? Or what, what are you using here? What are your dependencies? Oh, okay. So you're not using poetry markup save. Yeah, and get in the habit just of avoiding it. So for example, I'll open a PR. Uh, I ha haven't trusted this code, tested it or anything like that. But just to give you an example, uh, can I, uh, where's the thing? This one here. Can I just comment on this? No, I can't. But this is sus sus susceptible to a SQLite injection, to SQL injection, <laughs> SQLite injection as well. Also the lint, the, well, I don't know, this jumps out at me. It should be two, two lines or consistent spacing one or two but not one and two and you had white space there so i don't think rough is running so use this pre-commit every time you want to commit this will run we use this it'll run certain jobs but let me just really quick give you the example get table details get table details parameterized query thanks to chat gpt test that code out but you get the idea and we'll read more about this parameterization it's a small change, but makes a big difference. Check out pre-commit. This, like, uh, I can show you our pre-commit. So I got a uh, Jerry Life caregiving. This will help you keep your code clean and makes peer review easier because if everybody's just automatically linting and taking care of the low-level details, the peer reviewer can focus on higher-level details and not have to worry about oh, there's double, there's two lines there. Essentially, what it does is it just runs commands called hooks. Every time you commit or every time you push, you can configure it. I do it every time I commit. And it just does things like make sure your YAML is formatted correctly or your J JSON objects and TOML and, or you didn't leave any merge commit str conflict strings in there. That happens actually, surprising amount. Or you, that you're using the latest Python semantics, latest features and or Django features in our case. Uh, you got trailing commas and you, you pick all these things. You're running rough every every time you're running the rough linter and the formatter because now it does both curly linting here i'm linting my ten templates uh making sure we got our documentation strings are formatted correctly uh, our django html is formatted correctly we're running prettier on our css javascript json markdown and scs and yaml and we're keeping some things sorted so all of this is just run every time automatically super easy here's our example pre-commit Okay, cool. Remember to test. <laughs> that just came straight from GPT. I just copied and pasted it. Both of those. So, you know, put your own flavor in there. Make sure it's it's meaningful to your project. Okay, cool. So there's a few things. And uh, let's continue the peer review. So that's the main one.
But I like the idea. This is really cool, actually, to uh, help people see their uh, their sequel, their relationships. This is nice. I could see myself using this project. There's a similar one for Django called Django Tools, I think. Maybe Django uh, Surrender Schema Diagram. Can't remember. Django something. Django Extensions. That's the one. Oops. So I'm not saying it, that this is in any way related or should be anything about your project in relation to just coming up with an example of a utility that renders the schema. And that can be really valuable. Hmm. Well, I thought it had to there. Django extensions. Render, at least at one point it had that. It renders it like this. It's using graph viz. So it comes up with statics that don't log me in. Oh, here we are. Graph is pi dot. So it's kind of like static images that it comes out with. Whereas the, whereas your library, I think is going to be an interactive one. So that's actually pretty cool. Just, uh, it's nice to see, you know, reference code to see how other projects are doing it. Uh, Mermaid, although Mermaid JS, are they interactive or static? I can't quite remember. They're kind of like static, rendered in the client though. Or in this case, on the server and then getting sent out to the client. All right, so we've got tests. This is great. Uh, so one thing you can check out, you're an open source project, so you qualify for free code code. .io. Sign up by Sentry. I'm using this on pretty much all of my open source projects. Code Cove got acquired by Sentry. We're also using Sentry on our, our production app. Really good. And it'll help you keep your coverage in check. Uh, so basically, make sure that for every line of code you write that there's a test to cover that behavior uh, sometimes you'll have a, a test that goes over a whole function but certain uh, paths in the function like if statements like branches for example you won't have tested a particular case for that so i mean the code in yours is pretty straightforward so this coverage is probably complete but it's without measuring it we don't really know so all we're doing is like what is code coverage boom and here's an example of what it looks like it shows me like okay these lines well this is interesting yes yeah, so these lines are covered these lines aren't and then you have to be oh yeah there's an if statement here and my test doesn't ever get that condition so it's not covered so i can give you an example on our Western Friend project. We have our code coverage right here. Reporter running 98% code coverage. This is code cov. It shows you your whole project on complex projects. There's so many lines of code. It's, you're, it's mind boggling to even, there's no way you could really keep it all in mind. But this one shows me, there's a couple of hooks files in my helpers pie. That one probably I should be worried about. So let's check it out, helper pie. What was that under? Library helpers. And the key is, not only will this show you where your coverage is missing, dang, that's an unfortunate error, but it'll come up during your pull request. So like the lines of code you change, what's a good example? It's part of your CI process if you want it to be. Uh, I don't have any good examples here. Here's one, code coverage. Shows me the percent of coverage we have, and particularly how this pull request affects our coverage. Is it going to decrease it? Are there lines of code in this pull request that the coverage was affected? Something is going wrong. It's like processing commit message unavailable. Well, bugger. Not sure. You don't have to use this particular service in general for Python. In fact, this service uses Python coverage. So consider just adding, you would need to add it if you use code coverage. But coverage in general somehow into your development mindset we use um we use coverage pi at work we don't use coverage where i work but we use some other services and with western friend i'm also keeping track of the maintainability using code climate so that might be the better i think now i've merged test coverage into code climate so actually this one is the one i'm moving towards for some reason code cov is uh, not working so well but code climate, it's a bit tricky to set up, but it'll be part of your pull requests. And it'll keep track of your coverage as well as some code smells and potential bugs that you should avoid. Making things too complicated or 
we're not writing tests. For example, my models pi says F. No issues here. It's strange. Oh, because there's no code there. So it's a bit hard to get into the details. Anyway, so these projects help you write better code and they keep the peer review process uh, at a more interesting level. Strange, and I guess I've disabled this one. So that's why I've integrated them here. Pull request time, SQL to mermaid. So yeah, it's good though that you've got tests and you probably have sufficient coverage given the scale of that templates. Let's see, mermaid template. Uh, so this is stuff that your linter should have caught. It's not a big deal, uh, but just this indentation, sort of a sign of sloppy coding. Also, try to use const, let or const. We shouldn't really need to use var anymore. That's what GPT says. Okay, thanks for the stars, I appreciate it. Oh, okay, this is kind of interesting. So GPT recommends a refactoring, it's sort of like, um, this is good, high level stuff. First you do is initialize mermaid, then you add zoom to mermaid diagrams. Now granted, initialize mermaid is only one line of code, so that's a bit of a uh, unnecessary abstraction. But this is nice. Add zoom to mermaid diagrams, kind of self-explanatory. If it was a more complicated project, there was more JavaScript in your on load function, uh, that would make sense. Point is that a function should only do uh, stuff at one layer of abstraction. So in other words, Initialize mermaid is a layer of abstraction. So you're telling it, telling me what you're doing, but not how. I don't care how. Uh, not at this level. I just want to know, okay, you're initializing mermaid and then adding zoom. That's all I need to know. But then if I need to know, okay, how do you manage initialize mermaid? I can read that. But more complicated code is encapsulated. How do you add the zoom to mermaid diagrams? Uh, I see you're using D3, but I typically don't need to know those details. They're there when I need them. Then you can add a doc string also that I could actually hover my mouse over and just read the doc string. So it's like a level in between of understanding. So we'll add a, it's about a developer experience and about cognitive load. How much do I have to think to understand the code? If I'm just seeing that you attach an event listener load, I don't want to have to think very much here. I don't really care that you, you know, that the, the D3 is part of the thing, uh, or you know, these imperative steps. They're not so relevant to me. But when they do become relevant, then a doc string could just be all that's needed. Now, this doc string just kind of reiterates the function name. So that's your, you know, not very useful, honestly. But here's one. Oh, and I wrote a function within a function. This function gets hoisted, so it's available here, but it doesn't need to be within here. So that's a bit a weird thing. There we go. So let's see what it does here. Yeah, it's good. And the more contributors you have with a bigger team and the bigger project, you're gonna want to care about developer experience. Now it still didn't quite move that D3 select all. And that's an implementation detail, so we can go inside there again. Yeah, so let's take a look at this code. I think this is pretty good. So it's using constants. It's moved the constants to the top of the file so that uh, they're easier to maintain that way. And they are using uppercase, and uh, it's just a convention, but it uh, shows that, uh, you know, not only that, it can't be mutated, uh, the reference can't be changed, as far as I understand. Something to about, anyway, uh, it's also using capitals, so you signal that you shouldn't change the contents of the reference. Uh, yeah, and then if your mermaid class changes it in the template, you just change it here. It's easier, you don't have to kind of zoom into the details and read through all the imperative logic. So the things that, these uh, would otherwise be called magic, kind of magic values. So here you're using a literal, a string literal, and rather than tell me, you know, what is this string representing, but here, Gosh darn it. I know that, oh, it represents a mermaid class plus SVG. Yeah, very cool. So I'm gonna copy this. I think this is decent code. Copy out emptor, I didn't write it. I haven't tested it. But I would rewrite this more similar to what ChatGPT has produced for us after a couple iterations. And I would put this, I would actually put this in a JavaScript file and load that JavaScript. And be mindful about indentation and linting, just like um, it's a sign of a 
of craftsmanship or of attention to detail. And it's a lot of details to pay attention to. So have the tools do the work for you pre-commit. But let's see. So what we would do is create um, a JavaScript file. So we're gonna do this. SQL license remain, create a branch. Yeah, add a file. And this was under templates. So yeah, where's your, these other JavaScripts are coming from. Okay, so this is a bit challenging here, isn't it? Move this to an own JavaScript file though. Yeah, and all these things, don't take these as like criticism. These are just as you asked for. Some constructive feedbacks, practical things. And literally when I write code at work, this is the kind of stuff we get. And we try to also not just explain the what, but the why, as well as the how. And the reason that I think this is better to be in its own JavaScript file is you'll have tooling like Prettier uh, that's going to really work well with JavaScript, but might get tripped up on JavaScript within HTML. I think Prettier is going to be pretty good at it. But then you introduce these types of things. You got HTML, and then you have uh, JavaScript, and then uh, this is what's the name of this uh, templating language? I forget the name of it. But see, we're getting multiple languages intermixed, and then the linter uh, might get chip, like tripped up on it. So you would need a much more complicated linter. What's the template the language here? I can't remember. <laughs> and, and so you have a little str another string literal here, or just the class diagram, I guess. We'll wrap this in a paragraph or it's not just a naked string do you need that there ginger two thanks yeah <laughs> yeah ginger two can you delete this class diagram i don't know or is it necessary i didn't quite recall it at the very least move it here h and put it in the heading for example some kind of semantic unit by semantic i mean it tells me Oh, this is a header. This is a div page division or a paragraph. Uh, but as it was, you had a div and a div isn't telling me what kind of content is there. It's just a page division. It's not semantic. So if it's text, a user is going to see, use like a P tag, paragraph tag or H tag. Yeah, this is looking good. This is kind of complicated. You might move this. Uh, you might do some pre-processing in the Python code to make your template more straightforward. Like we're stripping out, this is sort of getting into the JSX thing where I'm like sort of thinking that when we're grabbing indexes and we're strip, stripping out is one thing, you know, Django has like a filter uh, tags, but uh, I would consider prepping this a bit better in the back end. I don't know on a pragmatic level, but I can ask ChatGPT. So templates should be really simple. That's the Django philosophy. I adhere to it. I agree with that. Django. Yeah, tests are challenging, aren't they? Essentially, tests often are more difficult to write and can even be found more time consuming, but the majority of your project code can actually be living in tests because <laughs> of the setup and the context and all the things you got to keep in your mind to even write them. It's very painstaking process. So yeah, I understand uh, the focus there. And these, and remember, our projects are just um, iterative, right? So while your your initial battle was with the tests, now you got those written, you probably have good coverage. Yes, yeah, so now you have a little bit of time to kind of relax, recompose yourself and clean stuff up a little bit more. And so here's an example. So original, huh. This is your original gen template. But here you go. So this can live more comfortably in Python. It's still doing all the work, but it's a lot. This is like, you know, you expect this in Python. You got list comprehensions and things like that. So you just put it in a Python function, prepare schema data, and then look at the, the template for data and schema data. Data table name, data column and data columns. Much cleaner, much cleaner. You're still doing iteration, you know, you have some basic template logic there, but templates should be real simple. Keep logic out of those as much as you can. Interesting. So I don't know if this would work in your case, but the general philosophy. Now, are you able to use um, 
GPT, I just use it like all the time. It's such a helpful tool. I think this is a pretty good example. Keep the imperative logic in programming languages and keep the programming languages out of the templates, right? Uh, even the JavaScript in the template, I think is, you know, unnecessary, but then how to link them up. I'm not sure in your particular case, because do you have a server running or it's, it's just pretty much invoking that. So it might not be good in this case, but at the very least, uh, here's a, an example of how you could refactor the JavaScript. Okay. I'll be right back. Uh, I'm going to use the restroom and get some tea started, but yeah, thanks for hanging out. It's really interesting. This is a cool project too. I like this idea. And I could use this actually in my Django projects because often in Django, I'm using SQLite and it's not always easy to see the database structure. And your project is really light, like it has very few dependencies. So I think this is really cool. Uh, is it published to PyP? That would be another thing. Okay, I'll be right back. Very cool. Or for a search page, opening pull requests. Then what I'll do is, I think this is a good idea on this refactoring. We'll open that. And branch. Ooh, cool. Okay, animated WebP. Did you just put that there? <laughs> I didn't notice that before. Last month, I see. Okay. Yeah, that's really cool. And, and you just put it in the readme. Yep, that's good. Man, cool. And just pan. You can pan it and everything. Our simplified templates by moving this stuff to the back end, letting Python handle this stuff. Let's see. So what we can do? Uh, probably in here. Okay, I don't know if I installed poetry. Sort of had a love-hate relationship with poetry. I don't have a virtual environment there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Yes. All right, so we got the dependencies installed and then if I reopen that, maybe. Huh. Uh, so here's the thing, rough. Organize your imports. What editor do you use? And we're not using OS. And you're not using um, unit test. And you're not using templates. Good. Clean those up. Okay, so you've got this init, get tables. Get table details, generate schema diagrams. What's this? E501. Ah, oh, it's too long. The line's too long, I guess. Replit. Okay, cool. I haven't actually tried Replit. Seems like a good kind of a platform as a service in a way it makes it really easy to run some code however this uh, project you only need to really run it locally so let's see rough things we're not using those the template but i guess if we do a case sensitive search case sensitive we're not I don't know, even uh, GPT got confused by that. So this may not work. So how do we run the pro project? Let's see the readme now. I'm a new B. I've cloned and I've installed the requirements. By the way, this is bad advice. You need to create a virtual environment. <laughs> I think you need to activate it. Then install. <laughs> Don't install global dependencies. Lint your markdown. Add uh, help text. Alt text. Animation. This is shell command. White space. Shell. Python is fun. Or pi. After your headings, do that. You got extra space there. Not bad, not bad. Good. Linted that. Thousand changes. Need to get ignore. Um, you might not use the virtual environment. You might use .env. I don't know if you've got a preference on a naming convention for your virtual environments, but you should ignore that. And your uh, Git will be happy, and you can run this thing locally. But you didn't uh, probably catch that one because you're maybe not working with virtual environments. Start using virtual environment. It's <laughs> really important. I heard the tea bell. I'll be right back. I'm going to get my cup of tea. 
Cool. By the way, do we have an example SQL light? I don't know. I mean, I have one, I guess. I can bring over. So let's see. Uh, one thing I'd like to do. Oh, nice. Let's separate these into um, really helpful uh, documentation. So we'll use uh, GPT. We're just going to split that out a little bit. Are you in uh, what, what development environment are you using? Uh, operating system, sorry. Yeah, Repl makes it easy. Yeah, and the code should always be running in a local machine. That is one of the main pain uh, points that I face at work. We're developing microservices architecture, sort of. It's basically a yeah, service oriented architecture, at least. And um, we can't really run the project locally. We're working on it. Times we can, we can run tests locally or have those in a Docker container. But man, it is challenging. All right, so installation still needs to be there. Mm. Git bash or GitHub desktop. Yeah, pretty good. I think GitHub desktop is on Mac as well. But the CD. remains the same so i'll just take that out and windows seems to be the same cool this is where there's a little bit of difference and these are all the same all right so i'm kind of lumping things together here simplified template and most of this can actually go into the contributing.md but it doesn't exist so we'll put it in the readme actually yeah all the installation instructions should go into contributing.md later you can do that ignore virtual environment dang it no Okay, so let's focus here. This is a dangerous change. So I actually want to be able to run this locally. So what I can do, what I can do is read the readme again. How do I do this? Ah, okay, so it's a bit verbose, but you do give an example. Yeah, and it's following the same thing now uh, by splitting all the commands, uh, which, but the problem is these aren't actually commands. Ah, here, this is what we need. Example.py. The problem, though, there are examples. Oh, of course. Yes, good, thank you. Really good. So you create some tables. You create a sample DB. Very cool. And you do the thing. And you do, wow, really good. Okay, so. Organize those imports. Remove the unused imports. This is copy and paste code. So yeah, double. Yeah, a lot of small details and a lot of this stuff you just work out over time, right? Or peer review. That's what's good about working in a team. So you get people looking at it from different perspectives. But let's go ahead and just enrich the, uh, give a full example here. And now one thing, there is, just see what the initial feedback is from GPT. It'll read over the code. It helps you come through it, in fact. To use this script as an example, follow these steps. Put that in the Starting to hallucinate a bit. The quality is degrading. Oh, it's because I'm using ChatGPT 3.5 this whole time. Wow. Shoot. Nah, it's not gonna work. Okay, so let's just try it out. See you. Ah, okay, so that's the problem. SQL to me. Okay, so we can't import it. So we don't have a Python module structure. So yeah, the example usage won't work directly without modification. Because we're not technically in a Python module, right? There's no init.py. So I can't really import I'm testing these. How do you, yeah, and how do you run these tests? I'm a bit confused, but perhaps you've got a simple solution. Oh, test, yeah, so that won't work. Okay, it's a bit challenging. Yeah, I just tried that, I changed into test and tried running the unit test, but we're not able to import. Yeah, good point, and I'm a bit perplexed, but it should be a simple solution. I don't want to turn your whole project into a, um, Python module. Yeah, it's confusing. Okay, let's just 
this is not the right idea. Oh, we don't want to do that. Okay. Yeah, and ideally you wouldn't have this in it in the base directory anyway. So you'll have to fix that. You could wrap all of these sort of in a lib directory. Man, this is tricky, but let's see. Okay, let's head over, head over to our friend GPT-4 templates. Now, GPT-4 has got a pretty big context window recently. So let's go all in on this. And we technically could be using um, Copilot to help us out a bit, but I like uh, the conversational style. Yeah, yeah, okay, I, yeah, the period in front of it. That makes sense, but I'm not sure if the parent directory can, uh, this one right here, can locate that. It's not a Python. I can't resolve it. But it's able to resolve that. Okay. But why can't I run it? Yeah, two periods. No known parent package. So here we would need the init pi, but I don't think this is the greatest idea, but okay. If it works. Yeah, when I get in these mind bogglers, we'll just ha have some help here real quick. One moment. To showcase how useful GPT-4 is in particular. Let me see if I can commit anything real quick. Because I want to make sure this change works. And this was just a lint. This whole... Go ahead and commit that. We didn't really change anything there. Just lint. The fix is crazy bad. We'll f we'll fix this. Get it because then you can publish this to PyP. I'm telling you, this is a really good library. This is really fun and useful, uh, and it's important to see your data structures, your data model. I'm just gonna replenish my tea. We'll be right So we'll use a couple of, first we'll just tell um, ChatGPT the structure, just the file structure. And I'm gonna omit the ones that aren't so important. Uh, Pi project um, requirements, but we do need the SQLite. All right, so we got the, I believe the crux of it. Oh, I forgot that test has an init pie, doesn't it? So yeah, I just gave it a bit of information and it's kind of helping us out with some general guidelines. It doesn't quite know what we're struggling with yet. Okay, so the templates. Are... Ah, there we go. So we should put it in a dedicated package directory. This makes your project structure clearer and more scalable. Additional considerations, set up pie. Create this file for packaging. Include details like install requires for dependencies, requirements, text, use it. Okay, we do have that. And uh, git ignore, like PyCache. And uh, GitHub has a nice Python oriented git ignore that includes more packaging and distribution setup tools, or you can use poetry, testing CI CD, version control, community engagement. Yeah, this is good advice. Now, okay. Or example usage, either way, let's see which one's shorter. 30, 50, 60 lines of code, test, 60. And in the tests, oh. So we're gonna ask how to restructure it from the parent folder. Okay, 
we got it. Oh, that's the fix, though. Yeah. And what does it say? Necessary only. So pie draft. No in it pie. Two point five. Dot dot dot. Absolute and relative imports. Sis path. Yeah, which answer were you thinking of? I think if we just restructure this, it's going to be better. Yeah, we don't want to do that. Just restructure it into a proper package, I think. Should be good to go. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Look at that. Set up pi. And this is a big gray factor, though, <laughs> just to be able to test it, though. Let's try it. We'll put your thing there. And then we need init pi. It's so weird. It's like almost like I'm doing something wrong here. Can you uh, run this locally on yours? Are you able to run these commands in your local environment? This is, I'm not sure what's going on here. No file. search oh, okay that's not a good idea good grief oh, option two yeah there we go there we go now we're running them okay so that was the deal Yeah, let's check it out. Oopsie daisy. Yeah, nice. <laughs> We're gonna run it. No, it's not unforgivable. Believe me, everything's forgivable. And that is important to think about. To avoid a culture of blame and uh, it's really been made clear to me the importance of that blameless culture by virtue of the place I work uh, practicing that it's it's hard to, it's really tempting to want to blame somebody or something for problems but uh, the idea is to focus on the solution and what to all right so shell how do you do the shell here replit run I have no idea how to use replit we'll come to this in a moment but I need to just fix this
person to see that the tests are working. Boom. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to ref uh, refactor the project real quick and then refactor the code. Uh, GPT 3.5 had hallucinated some code trying to simplify the Jinja template a few steps back. And uh, that's a good idea. We'll do that. But first, let's get your project in a way that's ready for packaging. That's a new file and it generated the output. Okay, so we can go to uh, local host 8000 and look at test HTML. Beautiful, yes, nice. Okay, can I highlight text? It wants to move. Okay, not a big deal. It's not quite SVG or something, I guess. Anyway, cool. Yeah, it's working now. After the refactor, we just had to put things in the right thing, and then I had to use the proper uh, module syntax. So yeah, you know, always learning, always a beginner. Don't ever you know worry about these mistakes or lack of knowledge because there's so much to learn and so much to know, uh, so much detail. Every day I learn. So let's see. Let me be real careful here. All I really have done here, just so you know, and you'll see this in your pull request, I'll open in a moment. We're just putting it in a namespace and I won't commit the output of the test. So in fact, we might uh, get ignore that. And so these changes, I'm you know, the slash stuff, I just moved the file without any change to the file. It's still, it's the exact thing. The tests there was a bit of linting you know using indentation using double quotes which is more common in python to use double quotes it's not a big deal but just so you know it was done by default and we need to add pycache to the git ignore oops and anything else let's see pi startup pi i don't know what that means pi installer pi charm pi installer pi compile optimized dll files that's probably good enough. And then always have a little bit of a white space at the end now. So this is essentially a refactor in lint. Refactor slash lint. And we added a module structure. So then now the other thing we can do is describe how to run the tests and clean up the tests because there's some things and this is the code not the tests but there's some imports that aren't being used so it's like uh, easy to remove those and hopefully i guess repl.it doesn't have a nice ide to uh, highlight with the squiggles yeah and this is just line too long not a big deal here what's this Oh, that's just my rainbow indent. I guess these are a little bit too far indented. There you go. Everything else is looking great. I don't think the GPT-4 has the readme in its little buffer thing yet, a little memory. Very cool, so we'll just add that to the readme. Under usage, so we have the usage section. I think since you've got an example script, we probably don't need that to live here anymore. So we can replace the whole usage with just this GPT thing. Use the tool to maximum potential and then be careful to scrutinize the output of the tool. So we we're able to successfully run the tests. Let's try this one. Oops, darn it. Shame I have Graham generated in there. Scheme diagram. It works. Might work on the width, the content width, but not a big deal. But uh, if you could use some scaling just to let it fill the whole horizontal thing. And then the tests. And since we know the output of these tests, an example 
we'll generate some files basically. We'll put those in the get ignore so they don't accidentally get checked in to the project by an unassuming developer. Sometimes you'll see people who will just like stage all commits and commit everything. So we wanna not do that, but in case somebody does do that, this is a little bit of a safety guard. So we don't want the sample DB. And we, now, and we don't want schema, and we don't want test. Good, and usage instruction. Okay, the last thing is I, I think this would be a good improvement, this uh, moving the stuff from um, Jinja. This was the whole thing earlier. Simplifying the template. So we've got, okay. And we did make those adjustments, so here is the template. Let's just see what it says. Sometimes we want to minimize the output of GPT so it doesn't use, uh, doesn't flood our context buffer with things that we're not concerned about, but also sometimes it gives us just helpful advice without prompting really. If I just say, here's what I've got and, and it'll tell me stuff about it. First, uh, we had refactored this using GPT 3.5 in my previous conversation. I can be a little bit more confident that the changes I'm making aren't breaking anything. This is good that you wrote those tests, super good. All right, ready? Test passes. Boom, hey, TikTok, boom. Thanks for the follow. That's a ton of emojis. Okay, ah, so the table users already exist. So this is sort of a bug. If I rerun, if I rerun the um, example, it attempts to create the SQL light again. So that's okay, easy. Yo, so basically, we might put a safeguard in there so people can rerun it. It doesn't need to generate the SQL again. You could even just check if the file exists and then don't generate it. But I wouldn't worry about too much of the checking the tables exist probably. Let's try it again though. All right, so we're gonna, I believe this is just good. Uh-oh. <laughs> we got test HTML, boom. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. The refactoring though, mm, broke. So I've got a regression. We've got a regression, unfortunately, but no problem. That was the SQL, that was the uh, GPT 3.5 output. Let's ask GPT 4, it's a bit more skillful. Yeah, good point. That's why I was able to do that regression in the test passed. So now you know a new test case, boom. Okay, what else was it? Holy gosh, it already did it. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Yeah, yeah, adding dog strings. I think it's JS docs syntax, right? What were the other things that we can do to make it more developer friendly? I think that's about it. We just have Matt. And we'll leave it open ended to any other best practices for the JavaScript language. I'm not expert in anything, let alone JavaScript. Oh, we're dang it, we're on the GPT-3.5 again. All right, no problem. Here's a nice GPT-4 conversation. Same prompt. Yeah, so this is nice. It didn't encapsulate the single line. That's cool, because I mean, it is basically mermaid initialized. That is one level of abstraction. Now, notice that add zoom to mermaid diagrams was a, several lines of imperative logic. So it did encapsulate those. And that add zoom to SVG is, it's like imperative logic at a different level of abstraction, different level of detail. It's kind of like zooming in and out of a map, right? You want only, uh, you want to see the states of the United States or the country or the counties and the cities. So we just use encapsulation for that. And it's got doc strings, uh, still using magic, but that's a, that's okay. It did uh, not create any constants. And the reason for that is you 
don't really know what G means. Why are we selecting G? You know, on Zoom, okay, that's self-documenting. On Zoom, that makes sense. Uh, event, uh, transform, uh, transform. If you have specialized knowledge, you probably know that this G is the is a, a, a SVG element. But here we go. Now we've got mermaid SVG selector, SVG group element, and zoom event type. So these are called you know constants or variables, named variables or explanatory variables. Um, for as kind of debatable as clean code is. Uh, I think it has some good nuggets of wisdom, including use meaningful and pronounceable variable names, but using searchable names or explanatory variables. Check these two out in particular. And these apply to any code you're writing. I know there's other viewpoints on clean code, but uh, a lot of the guidelines here are actually pretty useful. Uh, the book itself, I don't know, maybe has questionable advice, but I think this is a pretty good refactor now. However, does it work? I have higher confidence in the, uh, oh, you know why it didn't work, maybe. Wait a minute, there we go. In the GPT-4, you know why it didn't work, probably. Oh, no, 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 no. The indentation is just throwing me off. Yeah, I use that on a pretty, reg pretty regular basis. They also have a Python version, clean code Python. It's the same principles. And when, when we're, you know, giving peer review, we can point to these, you know, just like I did, I linked to the exact uh, guidelines. And so we have a shared reference and it's nice to have conventions. Python is really big on conventions. You probably know the Zeno Python and uh it is you know very useful also django is full of conventions so let's see then in order to run the examples um, usage i have to delete the database and in order to run the test i can just run the tests okay here's the moment of truth does the interactivity work yep where'd it go i can't read okay so i think this is a good refactor so um more trust in gpt4 You know, we've got, so documentation, got constants. Uh, we got name, you know, meaningful variables. I think a lot of this you were already doing, but uh, in particular, the caps encapsulation is, is good. And uh, also having these named constants at the top, in case your template changes, your selector changes, you don't have to go dig down through your code. You just change this here. Uh, some of this may be not so important, but nonetheless, it's just to illustrate the idea. Another, um, benefit that comes out of this type of a move is that you can then maybe not in this exact case but you you can unit test these so much easier than you could the entire imperative block you can mock and just test very encapsulated code and i find that particularly when i can't run the code in my local development environment having these granular functions that i can run unit tests against in an isolated fashion you know using mocks for example uh, really helps me when i'm coding by abstraction a lot of the time I, since i can't run the code i have to like just think how it would work or use gpt to help me with that yeah very cool yeah and uh by the way cookie cutter have you found those have you used a cookie cutter before python for example A lot of these base practices we learn over years, but really there's some projects that help you get a, a new library off the ground, a new Python project off the ground. Cookie Cutter is an example, cross-platform command line utility that creates projects from Cookie Cutter's project templates. Python packages, C projects. So in your case, it's a Python package, more or less. You can use this cookie cutter, but I think they have cookie cutters for uh, using the same cookie cutter library defined for uh, JavaScript projects as well. There's probably something similar in the JavaScript ecosystem that lets you initialize a project like node, uh, like um, view has these scaffolding things or I don't know, but this one's great for Python projects. You run it. It's interactive it asks you a series of questions and then it'll for example output a project structure with best practices baked in here's the pi package one this would be really good for the type of work you're doing where you have a package that's ready to publish and it includes things uh, some of them are sort of maybe not what you want but at least you can learn from the structure of these we're probably using github actions now pytest runner yeah so just just the general ideas it'll help you out 
and you might find one that's, that uh, fits your style. Saves you some time, gets you off the ground. Let's see, so I kind of made the case that it'd be better to follow the Django guidelines to keep the template logic minimal by moving the table and column parsing logic to a Python function that returns the appropriate structure for Jinja 2. This way the Jinja 2 template would be easier to maintain. And essentially here's what we've got. I'm gonna go to the restroom real quick while the, uh, well, it does its work. Cool, I got some tea. Yeah, so one of the other big takeaways you'll see here is that now I'm leaning pretty heavily on GPT and GPT-4. And in my opinion, that doesn't make me uh, worse or uh, like somehow. Anyway, the idea, I'm sort of getting a little bit brain fog, but the idea is that um, it's an assistant and it actually makes you more effective, more efficient. And uh, it's teaching me quite a lot all the time I'm learning. It's like having a senior software engineer at your side. It's not perfect, but then humans aren't infallible either. We also make bugs and hallucinate and all these things that we're complaining that large language models do. Frankly, I think large language models are pretty miraculous and uh, take them with a grain of salt just like you would a person. But uh, really, I think it's valuable to invest time in working with these because I believe they're going to be basically the future of knowledge work. I don't know that they will replace people. As you see, I still have this dialogue. I still have to guide. They're not fully autonomous. And if they were, it's not certain that they would be working towards the same goals as we would. That's a bigger discussion. But uh, I think it's really important to work with them. It's going to make a difference between, I believe, well, in higher ability and it'll I believe have a strong impact on you know the effectiveness of yourself or your team or your company and they've there's already been anecdotal but academic evidence of this i can find the study but essentially it, they compared two teams in, in marketing one team that used the large language model or generative ai in general not just llms and then the other that didn't and they found increased productivity and quality of work i think this was also demonstrated in a promotional material by Microsoft, but I've experienced the same in, in quality improvement in my own code and ability to move with high levels of uncertainty. A lot of times I don't really know what the heck's going on. And this is like having a flashlight. It illuminates this stuff and gives me insight into like the inner workings of Python, but still needs guidance. So here, here it is generated two functions that I can use one. Let me just follow complex out of the templates and into Python functions aligns with best practices in template design. JSX. Don't. It improves maintainability, readability, separations of concerns. To refactor your mermaid template HTML, you can pre-process the schema data in Python before passing it into the Jinja2 template. Yeah, we don't want to process all the uh, schema in, in Jinja. So here's all the, we're processing the schema and stripping and doing that and selecting. So create a function in your Python or JS or suitable module to pre-process process the schema. Very cool. So this is just a module level function. It could be prepended, prefixed with a underscore and underscore. I was thinking this would be a class member since it's the only thing using it. Also moving this into Python is gonna make it easier to unit test. I think the templates are a bit trickier to test, particularly we notice the interactivity, but also the fact, of, I didn't notice the unit test, the details there, but uh, the output of this, I think it's kind of fuzzy and maybe you're testing that there's a, I'm not sure, mermaid class. I'll look more into the tests, but regardless, I think Python's a bit easier to test. Process schema and generate schema diagram. So we're just going to move these into the class level and we might consider making them private members. And why is it giving me the squiggles? Rough 811. It should tell me what's going on there. Remove the redundant. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wait a minute. Uh, right. Of course. 
works. It's uh, I've got to update the generate schema diagram, or just remove that and then use this after pre-process. So it flows. Okay. He goes, uh, yes, now we update our template. This is a bit, well, let's see, it's a bit worrisome. Let's see. But it's essentially the whole div here and then indentation. And we'll remove sample DB. We'll start with the NTOS tests. Test pass. We will then use the example usage. Schema generated, diagram generated, HTTP server. Which one are we doing? Well, I can just refresh it, but schema diagram, interactive. Test HTML, interactive, okay, good. Wow, so I think we can, at this point, publish the branch, create pull requests, and if you're still with me, Blaze, might have a couple other touch, nice touches that we can do here. Wow, I've got a magic button. Whoa. I like that. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. Uh, one thing here, I don't think we need to dig into the table level. Ah, okay. So that's actually probably the more legit solution. So make sure you have the right structure. And is there actually data in the database? Just simpler. Oh yeah, that's true. I, I enjoy it and I hope other people can learn. I don't know how interesting it is to watch somebody code, but I, anyway, I do it because it's sort of like watching people work is really informative, but boring at times. <laughs> Learning is spread out and it's not necessarily in any meaningful order. So it's not quite like a, watching a tutorial. Although I find a lot of the YouTube t tutorials are pretty thin and uh, often times more oriented towards like getting, I don't know, people to view them, but not like pedagogical purposes. So it's more about what's the YouTube algorithm feeding uh, popularity. And a lot of times they get really just like almost clickbaity. I don't know if a better word of saying it. Are we using the develop branch? You have main, not really using develop might be good later in the project to use a develop branch. That's why this latent knowledge is in the large language model. But as a single developer, I can see why you just fork off the main and develop just gives you a little bit of breathing room to decide when to release. I suppose you can do that with main anyway. I don't know. We, we just conventionally do that and have a development testing environment, staging environment. So what this is going to do is re check out the repository. I think we're at action to check out ver version five by now. Four, okay, not too far behind. And set up Python's maybe at version five and specify the Python version. So this is an interesting thing. I would recommend testing against a matrix. Oops, oh no. Python 3.9 is deprecated. 3.10 is a bit problematic. It'll have to quote that. Might not work, the 3.10 might not work like that. Blaze Labs, wow, thanks. <laughs> For helping out iNode. Hey, welcome iNode, didn't even notice. You have, hope you haven't said anything that I missed, sorry. <laughs> iNode, thanks for the subscribe. That's interesting time. So I see, <laughs> I get it. I don't know how this Twitch thing works, I'm sorry. <laughs> so iNode is you, you, Blaze subscribed iNode. Very cool, gifted tier one, wow. All right, so we've got a matrix here. I don't, let's find out. Um, so we're gonna install dependencies, it's pretty straightforward, and then run them, unit test discover. Well, let's see if that works. All these I should be able to run in my local environment. Didn't discover any of them, so that's okay. The test command, now why didn't the discover work? Search for tests, I think that's why. We might need to rename this just test.py is fine. Yeah, that's all. Okay. <laughs> and for example, this could be just example.py. Not a big deal. Small changes. So I think this is a lot better than in general than going through all this stuff and doing a pull request. Show, don't tell. I mean, I'm kind of telling a bit, but I'm also just like literally showing and I'm learning a lot. So this is great. 
so since you're open source, you get a little bit of um, free, uh, totally CI minutes or something from GitHub just by doing this. Uh, let's see. Yeah, well, it should work. Okay, so check out V4. Set up Python, I think, is at V5. And we're going to just try this, but let's see here. And I'll double check. If you might have money to be in actions, GitHub slash actions or workflows. That's right. Workflow. And then test your test workflows here. Move. Okay. Might be able to make it. So get you in better shape. Now we'll check the pull request on on I guess it's against your repository. And see, get more close. I think that's correct. You might need to enable it, or the first time we add it, it might not run it. GitHub, spell it correctly. Workflows, tests. YAML. Uh, one of the things I think the deal is, uh, I'm an untrusted external contributor. So you might, if you hop over here to this pull request, it might say enable. It won't just run arbitrary things I put into your repo, which essentially GitHub Actions runs commands like this Python command. So I could be putting malicious code here that's going to try to steal your secrets or something. So it's going to ask you to verify that this command is safe to run. Like all of these, this whole pipeline is going to be safe to run. I. I want to run it because I'm not sure that this will work. I think it's going to search for Python 3.1 because this is zero, but it might might work. Let's see if other people have had this. Yeah, see, this is what I was worried about. I think we just have to quote it. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Uh. Quote them all for consistency. I think we're good to go. This has been a pretty extensive session. 256 lines added, 72 removed, so mostly documentation lines. Some refactoring. Simplification. And the tests still pass. Linting, linting, of course. Let me see how well the Western friend. Oh, come on. Just go, go, go. Rage clicking. Probably wouldn't need all of these, but paste these in. We can look at them. So checking YAML into file fixer, white space, drawing white space, uh, large file checker, case conflict, JSON, TOML, merge conflict, those are all good. Pi upgrade, this will keep you fresh with the uh, Python 3.11 and above semantics. Django upgrade, don't need that one. I'm a fan of trailing commas. I think they help with uh, pull request review in particularly, in particular. Uh, I don't know if that... Uh, any exclusions are needed. Rough, it'll fix it for you. Curly lint, maybe. Doc formatter, DJ HTML, don't need that one. Pre-commit mirrors, prettier, can be helpful. And Google Keep sorted is optional. Don't think you will probably need that. If I pre-commit install, Run it on all the files, invalid config, repos, missing key hooks. Oops, I missed a line there. So this is a fairly opinionated pull request. But it's gonna help out, I think, in the long run. Let's see if the tests still run. Doc formatter, run it again, it should pass this time. And let's 
generates a schema diagram and it tests HTML. Rerun those. So make sure the tests still pass and the example usage doesn't. Oh, right, 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 right. Because I renamed it. Localhost. Test HTML works. Schema diagram HTML works. So basically all this did is just linted everything. Added a trailing white space here, mainly trailing white space. Doc formats, so it tightens up our comments a bit. Trailing commas here, it's just a good practice. What is this? Ah, oh, interesting. <laughs> Node modules, strange. Okay. So yeah, these are all just trailing comma fixes. So just removed a little bit of trailing white space there, added the end of line, end of file. These all look good. And this will just keep things in good order. And it saves hassle during the pull, uh, PR review process. Pretty good instructions. This should go in a contributing guide. That's correct. That's correct. Cool. All right. Quit while we're ahead. This is a big pull request. I know it's like not good to always include so much stuff. 400 lines is a bit hard to review, but we've written it here on the live stream and I've demonstrated how it works. So I should probably wrap down, wind down the session. That's basically how I would approach a new project. And this is the most, uh, most of the ideas I've, I could think of for improvement here. Let's go back to our Western friend. Pull request, search page, deep source, complaining. Well, I don't mind. Yeah, I guess we don't need it, do we? Uh, common views, strange. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, so I can't change that. I wonder if that's the correct rule to disable the, con the if it's using pilot rules or where that's coming from. Well, let's just do this, PYL. It's a bit of a long line, so I think just no QA should work. All right, it's a bit slow. It's going to take a little bit, but all of our tests are passing. The change is fairly minimal. So wrapping up, let's see. I don't know if I want to do an outro. <clears throat> Four hours. Wow, it's been a long session, I didn't realize. Okay, I'll do an outro. That way I can kind of... Uh, Sort of share the content on YouTube in a way that's easy to digest without having to watch the full four hour thing. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I don't know if I'll be able to write scripted uh, tutorial videos. Maybe I'll figure that out. Mostly I'm working on stuff, but okay, ready? Hello and welcome to a recap of today's open source live code hangout. In today's session, we've been working on two projects, the Western Friend website, which can be found here on GitHub. And Blaze Labs is very interesting SQLite to Mermaid JS project, also open source on GitHub. We've got a couple pull requests. On the Western Friend side, I realized that our previous decision to redirect 404 pages to the search page was causing unnecessary load on the database. In particular, there are a lot of bots kind of crawling and scanning the site, maybe even coming up with random pages, and each of those is being redirected to the search, causing our slowest database query to run, which happens to also be a synchronous operation, so it's kind of blocking potentially other database operations. So. I decided that rather than redirecting to the search page, we will just put a search uh, form on the 404 page and let users opt into searching by clicking that little button. It also um, populates the search field with the essentially URL string, all the keyword, all the words from that, stripping out the uh, hyphens and slashes. So that way it gives them a little something to search for, typically the page title is embedded in the URL string. So that might get them a little closer. You can see here we use the um, search query and we have a function, custom 404, that grabs the request path, 
splits, replaces, actually just string operation doesn't split it, just replaces and returns that as a search query, renders a form. That meant I was able to remove a middleware function that was previously redirecting as mentioned. And the last change was to define the handler 404 in our core URLs pi, so Django knows to use this custom 404 views. Pretty good, I still have a couple of things to perhaps fix with deep source complaining in my test coverage complaining. I'm not sure why there, could be non-deterministic. Uh, some of these tests periodically fail and I'm rerunning them typically clears it up, but I'll follow up with that after the stream. Now the bigger pull request here on the SQLite to Mermaid JS. This is very interesting. We just took a look through the whole project, found some possible improvements. I'll read through these top to bottom, but we basically added a Python testing C continuous integration step for every pull request. Uh, it's gonna test against a matrix of Python versions, checks out the repository, sets up Python, installs all the dependencies, and runs the unit tests from the test folder. Pretty common, but really important, particularly for open source projects that might be used in downstream projects. You want those tests to run. We did find some improvements for the test cases uh, where there was a lack of coverage. We discussed briefly the importance of test coverage, uh, automatically determining which lines of code aren't covered, but also sometimes you have to just manually try things out and find test cases that aren't covered, such as the interactivity on the SVG diagram. Um, we added a git ignore because we were trying not to <laughs> check some files into git accidentally. We added a pre-commit configuration that runs a bunch of hooks every time you commit, essentially to help keep your code up to standard. These are low-level checks that oftentimes are kind of not so interesting for a pull request reviewer or sometimes tedious and easy to overlook as, while you're coding. This will fix most of them for you. You're formatting in JSON, YAML, TOML, you know, removing merge conflict strings, making sure you're using the latest Python features, trailing commas, and formatting and fixing and linting your code with rough, your curly braces in your uh, Jinja 2 templates, and running prettier against some other things. Every commit, this is really handy. I highly recommend it. We use it at my day job. I use it on all the open source projects pretty much. Uh, then I actually ran the uh, pre-commit hooks, so some of these are going to be lint. Uh, this was just a lint. Uh, we uh, expanded on the um, README, so just a bunch of uh, improvements to help uh, other developers or even uh, ourselves, our future selves, to know how to use the project. So most of the changes here are in the README, uh, to be honest. Uh, we used ChatGPT to help us out with a bunch of things. We reorganized the project structure so it was easier to run the examples and the tests. Um, these are mainly linting changes, and we added a little safety check here that if the database exists, we won't try to uh, create that again because it was causing errors that it already existed, and uh, we wanted to handle that exception. Uh, this is just lint. The bulk of the changes, we did refactor the SQLite to Mermaid.js. It's all highlighted in green here because we also <clears throat> moved the file so it gets not able to like diff it so easily. Then we kind of moved some, and we simplified our templates. We refactored the JavaScript to be more maintainable and potentially testable. And we moved some of the complexity out of the uh, template. Basically, templates should be really straightforward and easy, very minimal logic there. I know there's this uh, tendency to put a lot of logic in templates, particularly when you've got a templating language right in your programming language, like JSX. Uh, but I think for many reasons we uh, have learned and potentially forgotten that that's uh, kind of a bad practice. It uh, makes your templates hard to maintain. It kind of leads tight coupling in your code. Uh, so uh, basically we want to we want to move the complex logic to the code and the templates should be very minimal. Uh, this is the Django philosophy. I follow that. Uh, it, that's why get, Django gives us minimal logic such as looping or filters, uh, but most everything else is done in Python. So that's kind of what we follow here. And uh, some refactoring and formatting of the tests. So that's it. And the Python code got moved to the um, SQLite to Mermaid. Like the, the, the complex uh, template logic got moved here into a function that essentially does the same thing. Uh, right here, pre-process the schema. We were previously processing the schema in the template, and now we process it in Python. 
And that's uh, making it easier to unit test as well, because that could be a source of um, hard to diagnose bugs where you've got template logic running and not a clean way of testing that. Now, Python code is much easier to mock and test and things like that, especially granular, uh, composable Python code. Great. Well, this has been another open source live code hangout. Thanks, Blaze Labs, for stopping by. Thanks, Crazing, for the subscribe. I know. Welcome. Uh, it's good to see new faces. Let's see who else did we see here. I think those are the main ones. Very cool. Yeah. I hope you're all doing well. And I'll try to stream again uh, around this time tomorrow. And hope to see you around the stream. Have a great day or evening. And see you later.